Hi, I'm Dave Liu with the Mid-Atlantic Rimfire Series, and I'm here to, today to talk to you about a scope, specifically this Leupold uh, Mark V. Uh, this is a 5 to 25, and it is the, one of their premier scopes. I'm here to tell you, it's a great, it's a great scope, great scope for our sport, both, both the 22 precision rifle and, you know, centerfire PRS NRL cut type game. Um, so if you just want to tune out now, basically I like it, all right? But let's, let's dive a little bit into it and uh, I'll start talking about some of the features. So I had this loophole mounted on a Volkortsen uh, 1022 action and inside a Grey Birch chassis. And uh, we'll be doing some reviews on all these other things uh, at another time. But to get to this scope, it's selling for around the $2,000 uh, you know, MSRP price. And I got to tell you, it's well worth it. And I think it's hitting way above its, uh, its weight class. So I thought I'd go through some of the features as it's listed on the website um, to kind of tell you what I think of them, which ones, you know, that they say, you know, that they uh, advertise I really like and what are the things where, you know, it's not that not as important. The first thing that they list on their uh, website is the five to one zoom ratio. I understand why they put it first because that it's amazing. I don't know what they did inside the scope, but for some reason it just works really well. It works really well. It's very easy to find targets. On paper, you know, it's not very different from a lot of the other scopes out there. The field of view, it's on par with some of the other major scopes um, uh, that uh, most guys shoot. But for some reason, it's easier to find targets in here. I find it's much easier to, I don't know if it's the glass clarity, I don't know if it's necessarily the zoom, uh, zoom ratio, but somehow they've configured it so that it's, the, the scope just kind of helps you center in and find the targets. And that's probably one of the, the best things about it. And probably the, the, one of the most reasons why I, I kind of choose to go to it because it's easy to find targets. And, and as we know in our sport, finding targets a lot of times can be half the battle and you lose a lot of time searching for targets, especially hard to see targets that are obscured down range. With this, just gives you that little bit of edge. Uh, part of the zoom feature that we we're just talking about was it comes with an integrated throw lever. There's a little uh, knurled, uh, handle here that you can screw in or screw out and that gives you a little bit more purchase so that when you do have to zoom in and out it's it's easier and you don't have to go aftermarket pretty much everybody nowadays on their scopes they'll go they'll get some kind of aftermarket throw lever to throw in their their uh their zoom dial uh, this one comes with it so you know you get a little bargain right there next feature listed is the custom dial um honestly i don't really use this um, i don't know a lot of guys who do use it basically what it is is you can you know, write to and order from Leupold a dial that has your dope, you know, your, your drops and, and your, your distances for your ammo and have that etched onto a, uh, a turret so that they, they'll, you'll, you'll let them know what you need on there. They'll make it, send it to you, and you can replace this cap with their custom cap so that when it's, when you want to know, if you just want to, if you know the target's 100 yards, you just dial it to, you know, 100 yards as opposed to dialing it to the specific MOA or mill and you'll know that your scope's on target. Most of the precision guys uh, shooting our sport don't really use that because we change around a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, we change barrels, we'll change ammo, we'll change loads. Even in the 22 game, you'll, you know, a certain lot may be different. So, um, you know, you might not have, uh, you, you might have the exact same dope every single time. So making one with your dope on it, you might have to change it all the time. So most of us just shoot either mills or MOA. All right, the next feature is the zero lock dial. This has a really interesting zero lock uh, that um, I, I, I wasn't sure about at first, but start, after using it for a while, I really started to like it. Most of the time, what a zero lock does is it basically locks the turret down so when you're moving around, either in a stage or when you're packing it in, in and out of bags, um, your dial doesn't get bumped. It actually gets locked into place so that the dial can't turn unless you do something specifically. Um, a lot of uh, scopes nowadays, what you do is you, you pull it up, to unlock it and you push it down to lock it. That can get a little cumbersome a lot of times too in between stages when you got to dial a lot, you know, you got to pull it up or pull it down. And sometimes if you pull it up, it might slide down a little bit. Um, the way this works is it locks in the zero position only. So, and then there's a button to unlock it. So there's no pulling up and down. There's just this button right in front here, right? So once it, when it's in the zero position, it's locked, the button's out. If I want to turn it, I got to press on the button and turn the dial. From then after that, once it's dialed, it doesn't lock anymore. You can continue to dial it to whatever different distances, different values you need, and it'll stay unlocked for that entire time. Only, it'll only be locked again when you go back to your zero position 
When you dial it back to your original zero, the button clicks out again, you can hear it audibly, and it locks in position. In addition to locking it in place, it also reminds you to re-zero your gun after your stage. So if you want to lock your scope turrets after a stage, you have to re-zero it. That's one of our cardinal rules, which I think half of us know that we forget to do all the time. And we'll go to the next stage with the dial turned to our last dope. So this one kind of forces you to dial it back. To, if you want to lock the turret, you got to dial it back to zero, which is what we were going to do anyways. And it kind of incorporated all into that one system. So it's something that I've really grown to like. All right, next is the zero stop. So the zero stop is basically a way to set, set it so that when your zero is, when you, when you set your zero, there's a stop so that you don't dial past your zero. So when you dial all the way up, let's say you have to dial two revolutions up. When you go back, you don't remember, did I dial two? Did I dial three revolutions? This way you can dial it all the way back to your zero and it'll automatically stop at that zero. So you know where your zero is and you get lost in your turret, which is a common problem. This one has some great features as part of that zero stop. Number one is that you can dial five mils, 0.5 mils below the zero, which is really nice because every once in a while you do need, especially in the 22 game, if you're shooting at a closer target, you're going to need to dial down a little bit. So most of the time at a 25 yard target, if I'm zero, I, if I zero my rifle at 50 yards, if I'm shooting at a 25 yard target or closer, I'll have to dial down 0.2 mils. In systems that have a zero stop, where the zero stop stops at the zero, I'll have to kind of jury rig a, uh, a solution where I'll actually zero it at 0.5 mils below my actual zero, so that I'm in the event that I, when I do have to dial below it, I can do it. This already takes care of it all for you. Once you set your zero stop, all you have to do is push the button and dial down, and you can dial down 0.5 mils, and you don't have to like jury rig it. They already thought of it for you. So that's a great, uh, that's a really great option. So basically what you do to adjust a zero stop is you d uh, find your zero and then you unscrew the cap. You unscrew these little Allen wrench uh, screws on, on two sides here. And then you can loosen the, the, the turret cap so you can pull it off and you can turn it around back so you can set it to your zero. It's a pretty common way to do it for most scopes. The nice thing about this is the Allen screws are big. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to get older. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be, especially real small little Allen keys. So that the really small little ones that a lot of scope manufacturers use, they're so small and tiny, it's kind of hard to see them, especially in a dark indoor range. You kind of like, you can't even see the hole. These ones have a fairly large Allen key a hole, so that, and, and they provide the key as well. So finding it and using it, it, it it's a much better experience. And, and I, I really, really like it. One of the nuances though that I, I experienced though with this uh, zero stop, and I actually had to call them to kind of clarify it was, when I was dialing, I couldn't dial low enough to get to my zero. So what I ended up, and what they told me what you need to do is, when you can't dial low enough, you have to go ahead and remove the turret cap. Inside there's an internal screw that is really what controls the elevation. That's what you use to set your initial zero. Once you do that, you can put the cap back on, in the zero position and screw it back in and then it'll be calibrated to your zero. The next feature is that they list on their website is the side focus. All right, side focus, basically the parallax. For us, what's really important is not how high it goes, but really how low it goes. So this one is marked to 75, but if you keep dial, you can, it can dial below 75 to approximately 50. So 50 is usually where we shoot most of our, 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 our sighting in, our, our, our zeroing of our gun. So 50 is a good place to, to have parallax. But on occasion, some matches, you will shoot at 25 yards, and this doesn't parallax down to 25 yards, uh, maybe even closer to some matches. Some of the matches we shoot at, we'll shoot matchsticks at 25 yards. So that's what I did. I tested out, can this sh scope shoot matchsticks at 25 yards? So I took it out to my range, and I tried to shoot some matchsticks, and I was able to. Now, the only nuance to it is that I couldn't d zoom all the way down to the full max 25 power. Normally, for a scope that I can parallax all the way down to 25 yards, I can zoom all the way up to, to 25 power, and I'll be able to see everything crystal clear. Because this was closer at 25 yards, and I could only parallax to 50, it was a little bit fuzzy when I zoomed in all the way at 25. But really, all I did was I zoomed out to around 14, 15 power, which was plenty of magnification, even at 25 yards for matchsticks. I was able to put my crosshair, my little dot, right on the matchstick, 
and take my shot and I had no problems shooting it. And it was, it was nice and clear at the, the 15, 14 power. Even though it doesn't parallax all the way down, I don't think it should, that should hold you back because it's still quite capable of shooting closer distances as long as you're not totally zoomed in. Next is basically the size, uh, but I kind of want to talk about the, the overall, the idea of its size and weight. Yes, it's a lightweight aluminum housing. It's really light. It's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing actually, because it's actually a fairly big scope. It's actually a, a, a lot larger than other things. So that is something to consider is that whether or not, I mean, I guess, I don't know, for aesthetic values, but also for some, some situations where it may not fit certain guns because it is so long. But in general, I, I can't, I couldn't imagine, you know, anything that I really couldn't. But maybe in your a specific situation, the size is a consideration. So it is a large scope, but it's actually quite light. It's a lot lighter than a lot of the scopes in this class. So that's actually a, quite of a neat, amazing engineering feat that I thought of that it's, it's so light. Great for hunters, great for if you like a lighter package, a smaller, lighter package like the one that I, I built right here. Um, some guys like weight. Uh, weight's good. Weight in a rifle keeps it more steady. So if you want a heavy scope, this is not it. But if you want a more reasonable, lightweight scope, you're being a lightweight setup where you actually want maneuverability over, you know, uh, weight, then I think this is the, definitely the one for you. Also talking about size, it's actually a little bit bigger than the standard large scopes. Most larger scopes go up to 34 millimeters. This is kind of pushing the line of 35 millimeters. So these tubes are 35 millimeter tubes. A lot of the larger high-end scopes are kind of going in that direction, but in general, that's not the norm yet. So therefore, it's a little bit difficult to find scope rings that are made for 35 millimeters. Luckily though, the top tier scope ring manufacturers, they all make things in 35 millimeters. And right here, Leupold makes their own scope rings. And I really like these scope rings a lot. Um, you know, they're quite minimalist, they're real sturdy, and I haven't any, any problems with them at all. And, and you know, uh, and, and they fit the scope perfectly. So um, that is one thing to consider though, the tube diameter is somewhat larger. Next on their list is their zero lock adjustments. Basically what they're talking about is their turrets. So one of the nice things about having a 35 millimeter tube is that you get a lot more adjustment in it. A lot of people think 35 millimeter tube will add more light Yes, you will capture a little bit more light, but really what it allows for is allows for building a larger erector inside the housing, the scope housing, uh, the tube housing right here. What that allows you is it gives you more elevation. You can build more elevation into your scope. They advertise uh, 30 mils of uh, elevation. With my setup here, there's a 20 MOA rail on this uh, on this rifle, so so there's a little bit. Uh, I've lost a little bit of down cant. I get about 24 and a half mils up elevation in here, which is fantastic. So basically, two and a half revolutions I can dial up in this scope. The turrets themselves feel and sound really good, nice and positive. Just enough friction so that you know you can feel it, but not too much that you feel like you're forcing it. Good sound. I don't think anybody who who is a snob about turret clicks, I don't think we'll have a problem with it. So that's the, the elevation turret. And we've already talked about all the, the zero stops and the locks on it. Um, so what I'm talking about here is how the reticle is designed to let you know where you are in the number of revolutions you are spinning. So you start basically at your zero. Your, your button is locked and you can't turn your turret. And this top button is down, right? So then you press this button in to unlock and you turn. So you can turn all the way around, and the, each revolution, there's 10.5 mils. A lot of people ask, well, why 10.5 mils? Well, the genius of Leupold is that, so that you can offset these numbers. So here we're at 10. At 10, you can start seeing the button here starts becoming recessed. It's not sticking out anymore like it was before. Down here, the button was sticking out. You go to 10, it starts going, becoming recessed. So after 10, you know you move up, instead of, lo instead of looking at the bottom line, after 10, you're looking at the middle line. Because now, here, we're at 11. And this button now is flush with the, uh, the turret. So now you know that you're on the second revolution. I'm on 11. So I'm going 11, 12, 13. You can keep spinning all the way around until we get to another 10 and a half, right? So at, here, we're at 20. And at 20, you can start seeing this button starts becoming recessed. So it's not even flush anymore. Now it's recessed. So now we know that instead of using the middle line, we're going up to the top line. So here, we're at 21. One, the button's all the way recessed, and two, you actually have a tactile nub here comes up. So now we know that we're at the third revolution on, the, on this, uh, on, the, on the third revolution of the turret and using the third line on the, uh, the dial here. So 21, 22, 23, 
24, 24 and a half. That's about as far as I go. So going all the way back, that comes back in, the nub goes down, another revolution. So now we know we're in the second revolution. And then here we're back to the first revolution when the button comes out, and then it goes back to zero and locks in place. On the windage side, it's a capped windage turret. I like that. Like most of uh, you know, a long range precision shooters, I don't uh, dial wind very often. Uh, most of the time I hold it within the reticle. So therefore a capped windage turret just takes that element of maybe I'll knock it or rotate it out of, out of, out of play. It's capped, you won't, even if you bump it, it's not gonna change your windage. When you unscrew the cap, you'll see that there's no zero lock on there. It's just a regular dial. So that's why it's capped, so you don't really need to lock it. One of the really interesting things about the windage, which kind of shows that they really kind of thought through of how precision rifle shooters shoot these rifles, the windage notch, like the line where you look at to see, you know, when it's lined up at zero, it's not on the side. It's actually marked up a little bit higher on the, um, on the, the, the scope housing. The idea being, most, a lot of times when the mark is on the side, it's difficult to see. You'll actually have to come off your rifle, crane your head around, your scope rings or whatever, to be able to see whether your windage is at zero or not. This one, because of its position a little bit higher on the, the housing of the, the scope, you can just lift your head a little bit and you're able to see that your, your, what your windage value is. And if it's at zero or if you need to dial it to whatever else you need, it's all you need to do is raise your head a little bit and you can do it. All right, the other thing that's a little bit different from standard reticles is the fact that the um, increments between the mill hash marks, between for instance one and two, are in quarters, in 0.25. The standard nowadays has been 0.2. That's what most, most of the popular scopes have been using. So every 0.2, you'll have a little hash mark. Here, it's every 0.25. So it basically cuts it up into quarters. I wasn't sure about that at first, but I ended up really liking it. It seems like my brain and maybe a lot of other brains probably work really well cutting things up in halves and in quarters. It's, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's very intuitive. So I really like that they, they've, they implemented this quarter hash mark and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan now. And it's, it's something that my brain kind of flipped on and used quite easily. Now, the one thing I did have one little criticism about this specific reticle was the, 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 vertical, the vertical line. So typically in a crosshair, if you can imagine a crosshair, you'll have a horizontal line and a vertical line, right? Well, in this one, the vertical line above the center only goes up two mils. Now, why is that a big deal? Um, because I like to do what's called holding a lot of times when I'm shooting. When I'm shooting fast and I don't want to dial all my different targets, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll dial the farthest target. So my crosshairs will be on the most difficult target usually. And then what I'll do is I'll hold above the center of the crosshair. First time I did that with this scope, I looked into the scope and I realized I only had two mils above the, uh, the crosshairs. So I wasn't actually able, and I kind of ruined the stage because I kind of didn't think ahead, just kind of assumed that they would have the, all the mils going up. This one only has two. I get the reasoning. The idea is to unclutter the, uh, the, you know, the, what you're seeing, right? The bottom has the Christmas tree, so the above, if it's nice and clear, nothing's obscuring you, and that's good. I mean, you'll be able to see things a lot better. But if you want to use that technique of dialing the farthest target and you know, holding up above the, uh, the center point, you can't really do it with this scope because you can only go up two mils. That being said, there are many, they have a lot of reticle choices and some of the other ones do have crosshairs that go all the way up. If that's something that you do a lot, there are other reticle choices that you can choose from that'll allow you to do that. Well, hope you liked the video. Um, as you can tell, I really do like this scope. That's my honest opinion. I'm gonna be using this guy for a long time in the future. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Guns.com has been very good about returning and answering everybody's questions on all their products. So thanks for watching. Uh, hope you have a great day and hope to see you on the range.